I just had surgery for a condition called endometriosis and after the surgery the doctor told me that given how advanced it was I've probably had it for 15 years. What's crazy though is that this is such a common disease and I've gone and seen so many doctors and yet I only just got diagnosed with it this year. The clip that you just saw was from two months ago and I'm very well now so don't worry about me. I also want to say that this video is going to say some things that I think should change about medicine but this isn't a complaint about the medical attention I've received because I'm very very grateful. I mean look at these photos from my surgery. Endometriosis, at least in the later stages, can glue a bunch of your organs together which is why some of these photos are such a mess but I mean, look at the photo from afterwards. That's an extreme makeover. It took a long time to get this diagnosis though. I'd been to many doctors and asked about my mystery illness. Sometimes I'd complain about period pain or about the bloating or about how I'd often feel so tired it felt like I was moving through a haze. They'd always try and help me but nothing really worked and I thought that maybe these symptoms were just normal and it was all manageable anyway so I just kind of didn't do anything. Eventually though the pain became pretty extreme and it wouldn't stop so I called a GP. He said he had no idea what was wrong but agreed that this wasn't normal and he sent me off to get an ultrasound. Meanwhile though, I idiotically decided to google my symptoms and decided that the sudden pain was probably from an ovarian cyst. Ovarian cysts can cause intense pain like I was having but they're benign and they go away on their own and so I just decided that I probably didn't need to go back to the doctor to see the ultrasound results. I let a month go by but then I came across this AI medical diagnosis app called Ada. It asks you some questions about your symptoms and then tells you the probability that you might have some disease. It told me that I likely had endometriosis, a condition I'd never heard of. It sounded serious enough so I went to the doctor and lo and behold that's what my ultrasound showed that I had. How is it that an app was able to figure out what I had with a few simple questions? That's what this video is about. I'm going to explain why the problem of diagnosing something is a very challenging mathematical problem involving something called a causal Bayesian network. We'll see why humans have a hard time with this sort of problem and how computer algorithms can help. Suppose someone like me wants to find out if they have endometriosis. First we need to know how common is this condition? Pretty common unfortunately. Approximately 1 in 10 people who are assigned female have it. It's going to be useful to think about that probability by imagining 10 different people just like me who are getting diagnosed. One of these people is the unlucky one who has endo and the other nine don't, but none of them know their fate yet. Now let's ask them about their symptoms. Very painful periods are a hallmark of endo. Pretty much everyone with this condition has it and so this person will too. However, some of these people without endo will also have it. How many? I found it really hard to get a good estimate that I trusted, so instead of giving an accurate number here, I'm going to overestimate it just for the sake of argument. I'll say that one third of people without endo have comparably painful periods. If this were all true and one of these 10 people said that they don't have painful periods, then what can you deduce? If a person doesn't have this symptom, then according to this picture, they must be one of these six and so you can be sure that they don't have endo. If someone instead says that they do have this symptom, then they must be one of these four people. So what's the chance that they have endo now? The chance is one out of four. So by knowing this one symptom, we were able to increase a person's chance of having endo from one in 10 to one in four. Remember, this is probably an underestimate because I overestimated how common bad period pain is for healthy people. We can get more information though to really narrow down the chances by asking these people about another symptom, bloating. Some sort of bloating or digestive pain is a very common symptom of endo. I saw one study that claimed it was around 80% of endo sufferers who had it. For the sake of this calculation though, I'll pretty much assume that it's 100%, even though that's not true, just because it's a little bit easier. You can verify that this doesn't change the numbers too much. 
How about the people without endo? Again, it was really hard to find information, so I'm going to overestimate. I'll say that about a third of these people have it. Now, if someone tells you that they have both heavy periods and bloating, what's the probability that they have endo? Well, they can't be one of these two since they don't have both of those symptoms. They must be either this person with endo or this person without. So the probability that they have endometriosis is a half. In our model, having both bad period pain and bloating makes the chance that you have endo around 50%. The numbers I use for this little calculation suddenly aren't accurate, but I hope that they showed you how you can turn pieces of evidence that on their own aren't that conclusive, like symptoms or even blood tests and ultrasound tests, and combine them to get a more solid picture. This is called Bayes' rule. In particular, this is Bayes' rule in the ratio form, which in my opinion is way more useful than the usual way it's written down. However, Bayes' theorem isn't gonna cut it for the actual problem of diagnosis. That's because in the real world, there are so many potential conditions that a person could have. This calls for causal Bayesian networks. Let's see what those are by imagining a simple world where there are only two conditions, A and B. It's possible for you to have one of these, none, or even both. Each of these has a bunch of symptoms that it can cause. However, they'll also have some symptoms in common. Let's say that tiredness is a symptom of both, but it's a more common symptom of A than B. What that means is if you have both A and B, you'll definitely be tired. Whereas if you have neither, then you won't be tired for sure. But if you only have A, then your probability of being tired is a half. Whereas if you only have B, you have a one quarter probability of being tired. Suppose that someone in this world is tired. Should you diagnose them with A or B or both? You might have said A since the symptom is more likely for A, but that's not the only thing to think about. What if A is less common than B? Say its probability is a quarter and B's is a half. Given this new information, how should you diagnose the patient? The calculation I'm about to show you isn't obvious. In fact, when I was drafting this video, I realized I'd forgotten how to do it. And I had to sit for a while and reinvent the wheel. The trick is, the fruitful way to think about all this is by considering the four disjoint possibilities. A patient might have both A and B, only A, only B, or neither A nor B. What's the probability for each of these? Let's work it out. The probability of having A and B is the probability of A times the probability of B. The probability of just having A is the probability of A times the probability of not having B. That's a tricky one. We can work out the other two in a similar vein. I've written these probabilities as a ratio because all I really care about is how likely each of these is compared to the others. Another way to think of it is this. For every eight people in this world, one will have A and B, one will have just A, three will have just B, and three will have neither. How many people will tell you that they're tired? For this, we're gonna need to consult our Punnett square. The probability that a person in the A and B category has tiredness is one, so everyone in the group has it. On the other hand, only half the people who have just A are tired. One quarter of the people with just B are tired, and none of the people without the diseases are tired. We want this ratio to look nice again, so we're just gonna multiply everything by four, but that doesn't actually affect anything. So what does this say? It says, if we only look at people who are tired, for every four of them that have both A and B, two have just A and three have just B. In the end then, if someone tells you that they're tired, you can conclude that they're a little bit more likely to have B than A overall, but the most likely thing is that they have both. When I wrote this example, I tried to rig the numbers so that both A and B would end up equally likely, so I was really surprised to see that it didn't work out that way. Last night I spent ages trying to get some intuition for why, and tried to figure out how you could easily tell which disease was going to be the more common one without having to do all this calculating. I couldn't figure it out though, so guess what? That's homework. No, really, I'd like you to figure this out for me. Okay, so back to the Bayesian network and our patient who's just told us that they're tired. For this symptom, we can say that both A and B are almost equally likely, 
But let's try and narrow it down. Which of these symptoms would you ask about next? Let's ask about something that's a common symptom of A, but isn't super common amongst people without A and isn't caused by B. If a person says that they have that symptom, then that would raise the probability of A. If you've done some econometrics before, then you might recognize this as an instrumental variable. Here's a tough question though. Because this patient was tired, we found the probability of them having B to be seven over nine. Now that we know that they also have this symptom of A and the probability of A has gone up as a result, does that change the probability of B again? Feel free to pause the video and really think about this because it's a tough question. The answer is, it does. The reason the probability of B was high in the first place was because tiredness needed an explanation, and A and B are both possible explanations. But now that we have more reason to believe that A happened, we don't need B as an explanation as much. Therefore, the probability of it becomes lower. That was a tricky situation, so to understand it, I recommend that you make up some numbers for this intuition and verify it mathematically. I did this when I was making this video and it really helped me clarify what it means for something to be a symptom of A but not B. So honestly, try it. Anyway, you can see that these Bayesian networks can be hard to understand even in the case where there's just two diseases that are independent from each other. But what about the case when they're both related by some other disease? Or when there's many symptoms for each? Every time you find out a patient does or doesn't have a symptom, you need to update all of the probabilities involved. As you can see, it's very hard for a human to keep such a vast network in their brain and correctly update all these probabilities as new information comes in. Whereas computers have a much easier time of this. That doesn't mean that I think the computer should completely take over diagnosing patients though. There's lots of advantages the human doctor has. For example, doctors understand patients better and are better equipped to translate what the patient is saying into actual accurate symptoms. That's why I think that a hybrid approach is probably the best. Maybe before coming in, a patient should answer questions from the AI and then the computer can synthesize what it thinks is the most likely issue and the doctor can use that information to help them when they're talking to the patient. But what do you think? I'm not a real doctor, so there's probably all kinds of subtleties that I'm missing here. So for your first bit of homework, I'd love to hear what you think about this problem. The second thing I'd like you to do is if you have some of the symptoms that I did or a friend of yours does, please read the extra information that I've put in the description and seek medical help and ask about endometriosis specifically. And here's the fun homework. I want you to dig into the mathematics of this stuff, starting with the two problems I've mentioned already. Try it and send me your working out either here or on Twitter. I'll post a follow-up in a week based on what you guys send in. Okay, good luck. Have fun.